Welcome to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where we focus on discussing topics to help you burn fat, optimize health, and improve performance in life and sports. Transform the whole you from the inside out with the holistic method. Let's dive in. Here's your host, Debbie Potts. Hey, it's Debbie Potts, and I am the host of the Low Carb Athlete Podcast, where I focus on bringing on guests on the show and talking about topics on my own to help you learn how to burn fat, improve performance, and longevity. Part of that process is N equals one experiment, learning and course correcting and figuring out what works best for you because we are all unique individuals. We all have different backgrounds, different stressors externally and hidden internal sources of chronic stress. But today's show is with a guest who is actually interviewing me. I thought we were going to just talk shop, but she wanted to interview me for her new podcast And so I thought I'd share it with you so you understand a little bit more about my background. If you have not read my book, Life is Not a Race, It is a Journey, if you don't know kind of my purpose, as we all have a why. Why do we do the things that we do? How do we make choices? They're based on previous experiences (laughs) often and kind of understand my mission. Why am I focused on talking about health topics? Why do I talk about cortisol, the Dutch test, GI map, and all this stuff? Why did I become a nutritional therapy practitioner and an FDN practitioner? And now I'm getting back to my roots talking about metabolic testing. And it's all about testing and not guessing because we don't know what we don't know. And we can't just settle for, oh, that's how I am. That's what it's going to be like. We should ideally be striving to thrive every day and not just settling for that's my normal. I want you to realize that just because you're not at your reaching your goals, you're not at your full potential, you can set a game plan up to get a personalized program that's designed for you and you probably might see a little more improvements in your training for events for races, maybe you're just training for life, the endurance of life as myself. I'm just trying to improve the second half of my aging process and be a better version of myself as I age. So I shared a little bit of my story, my background with Dr. Millie. She's a UK-based GP lifestyle medicine doctor, senior clinical lecturer in a primary care academy at Lancaster University, GMC, her uh, she's also educator of health educator and health advocate podcast host of this new show she just recently launched called boost and biohack your health she has a strong passion for education and really helping the public on health topics specific interests in principles of healthy lifestyle lifestyle medicine and how we can use these lifestyle habits to optimize hormonal health and to reverse chronic conditions as type 2 diabetes. You can follow her on Instagram where we actually connected at Dr. Millie and her website is Dr. Millie, that's M-I-L-L-I dot C-O dot U-K for blog posts, recipes, and information on how to book educational events and talks with her. She is super fun, and I really love chatting with Dr. Millie. She is on Instagram, and that's where I found her the most. But we connected and did a little chat, and then we did a podcast. And she wanted to kind of learn more about me and what my why is. So hopefully this is interesting to you. If not, just skip through it. You don't have to listen. But before we start, let me go over one of our uh, LMNT special edition, special flavor. My favorite is grapefruit salt is coming back. It's just a seasonal special salt. So let's check that out. All right, here's how you can stay salty this summer. It's grapefruit season with grapefruit salt on May 25th is making a return just in time for the summer. And 
and I am excited to share this information with you and you can check out the other LMNT flavors on their website and get a free sample pack using our code low carb athlete. I use unsweetened element every day because I am often low in my minerals and I again test and not guess I found out my mineral balance with my HTMA test from upgraded formulas which is your hair tissue mineral analysis test you can check out upgraded formulas and get a discount on their hair tissue test which is very affordable great information and you can use again our code low carb athlete so super excited for element to bring back grapefruit and then you can also just get my what i get every month is the unsweetened so if you are sensitive to stevia as myself check out the unsweetened flavor element tea which is no flavor <laughs> and you can really work on getting your electrolyte balance in the summer as we start training in warmer weather we really want to make sure we have proper hydration as we don't sweat out water, we sweat out minerals. So really important to check out the science behind Element. It has all the information on LMNT. You can look at their science on drinklmnt.com library, find out all their, their blogs and science-based backing of their formulation, and kind of going into what are electrolytes. You want to get the right mineral balance in your body, boost your energy, improve performance, help your recovery process. As electrolytes facilitates hundreds of functions in the body, including the conduction of nerve impulses, hormonal regulation, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance, something we all need to be concerned about, not just drinking plain water all day. So if you have any headaches, which I can tell when I'm getting dehydrated, I get a headache. If you have muscle cramp, like I'm swimming and you get that toe cramp or your calf cramp, I get that when I'm dehydrated. Fatigue, sleeplessness, if you have trouble sleeping at night and other symptoms you might have for electrolyte deficiency. I think it's important part for our performance as athletes, and especially as I start biking more, the weather is supposed to be gosh, in the 80s this weekend in North San Diego. So I need to really stay hydrated, and especially when I swim outside, I think I, I need a little more electrolytes. And also, if you are new to being a, a low-carb athlete, you might find you're a little more deficient in electrolytes. So that's where Element comes in handy. And I just put it in my water bottles and just have that, especially when I do the sauna. I've been doing the electrolytes before during and after so check out element and check out upgraded formulas and you can use our co code low carb athlete to enjoy getting the right mineral balance and knowing your mineral balance with upgraded formulas htma test talk to you soon so welcome debbie thank you very much for joining me on my show today so do you want to tell the listeners a bit of background about yourself what you do and what your why was <laughs> well uh thank you for having me that's a big topic. Uh, my why is is kind of based on my previous life as an endurance athlete, competitive, high charging athlete, competing in Ironmans and 50k trail runs and marathons every year. And so I was a personal trainer full time and owned my own fitness studio for over well 10 years. That I tried to work hard to make it an all in one studio. And over the years, I had what's called a, adrenal fatigue, adrenal exhaustion, which is mm -hmm. not a real word. We know it's more HPA axis dysfunction. So everything I was doing as a high charging athlete kind of came to an end. <laughs> and the way I was doing it in 2013, just exactly 10 years ago, right now, it's when my life changed and never never been the same since. And my mission now is just to help other people similar to me that are that driven, ambitious, high charging athlete trying to do everything they hear about and experiment. And I was kind of thriving on more is better, which kind of backfires. Mm. <laughs> so I became a nutritional therapy practitioner, a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner called FDN, where we can order functional lab tests. Before that, I became a Paul Check, the Check Institute Holistic Lifestyle Coach, Metabolic Efficiency Coach. So all this stuff just kind of led me 
down the path to learn more to integrate all this information together in what I call the holistic method. And so now to answer your question, I coach athletes similar to myself who are struggling getting the desired results, even though they're trying all the right things that they hear about and listen to and read about. And I feel like there's so many athletes out there struggling, trying to, you know, get their body and energy, their vibrant self back again. And they just can't figure out the why. So what I do now is more of a health investigator, really investigate what's Mm -hmm. going on, external stressors that are just kind of causing some craziness in your body, but they accumulate with these hidden internal sources of chronic stress, which is why I became an FDM practitioner because I can now order functional lab tests with our medical director and do advisory session with them. And so then I can really investigate and collect data and go down many rabbit holes and try to figure out what's the why for this person. It's always more than one thing, but that's what I do now is kind of fun. Wow. So you've you've been on quite the journey there. Very interesting. You've said some really important things I'd like to pick pick apart, really. You've mentioned about how you work with athletes um, and looking at why they're struggling and taking a holistic view. So what common things do you see in, in those people when you when you do assess them? What is there any common strands of why why they're struggling? I know it's all very individual, but Yeah, it's very individual. I see me. <laughs> I see the previous Debbie before she changed her whole life just a couple of years ago, moving from Seattle to San Diego and having to just redo my, my schedule and my way of living. But I, I find a lot of people, well, we've talked, you know, too much fasting, not mm. figuring out what to eat and they're eating too little. And I think I was doing that. I was fasting too much, you know, more after my adrenal issues, I started getting into fasting and started just doing OMAD every day, but I was training three times a day. And so really figuring out so much that we didn't know back then of when is it appropriate to fast as an athlete and a female athlete Mm. and when to, you know, I was doing keto, low carb, starting back probably 2008, 2005, I started metabolic testing and figuring out how to train to burn more fat. But then I started learning more about doing fasted workouts and Bulletproof coffee back in 2000, I don't know, eight, nine, and started dabbling in all that and had great results. I mean, I was winning age group or top in my age group, doing Ironman Hawaii every year, but, you know, kind of downhill spiral in the end of 2012, I did my best races. And then 2013, it was, you know, crash. So it is looking at athletes similar to myself that are trying to do all this fasting that we hear about trying to do just this low carb keto diet and not get their, you know, think that all carbs are bad. It's, it's Mm -hmm. what I call my show, low carb athlete doesn't mean zero carbs. It means more what we talk about Dr. Mindy is that nature's carbs. And, and then now we know to feed the hormones, the estrogen during ovulation and progesterone. So it's just really looking at the male and female as different people. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Genders are different, but then each individual within that and look at their lifestyle. Cause a lot of athletes are really busy already. We're already that type mm-hmm. A driven individual that we're working full time. We have people have families, they have kids, they've got other responsibilities. And then, then they try to fit in their workouts in the morning. Like I've had two clients recently that fit in, wake up at three 30 to work out at four so they mm-hmm. can get it all in before they go to work or before they wake up the kids, get everyone ready to go to school and go to work. And, <laughs> It really, you know, can only, you only can tolerate that for so long until your body breaks down and burns out. It's very true. You mentioned earlier as well that the ethos that more is better. You know, a lot of people are like a super, one of my colleagues has wrote a book, mentioned superwoman syndrome. And it is the the feeling that we have to do everything. And, you know, I've tried to be working more smarter, not harder this year in terms of the way that I work and also the way that I exercise. So tell me a bit more about how we can work smarter, not harder than how we can work on that ethos. Yeah, I think what I've learned, you know, from messing myself up so many times, because I feel like I did have adrenal exhaustion starting in 2013, but then I, I kind of relapsed by doing this extended fasting and too, too mm. psychotic about keto. <laughs> but I was just so incredibly strict because that's how we are. 
do everything to the extreme, but I was still training a lot and, you know, it adds up. But I think what I know now, I, I wish I know that I have a t-shirt that says that <laughs> I wish I knew back then what all this stuff I know and I wouldn't have broken myself, but it's, it's smarter than not harder. Yes. It's my philosophy. I think was more is better. Now it's less is more and how to get that minimal effective dose of say your workouts and, and create more of this intuitive training, intuitive fueling approach that, Mm -hmm. you know, after you are switched to more of a, you know, primal paleo, keto carnivore, whatever I like to say, real food diet that balances your blood sugar, that's nutrient dense and you're feeding your body, you're feeding your Mm -hmm. cells, the nutrients it needs to thrive every day and recover and repair from your workouts well, then you can, you know, be okay with adding in some berries that are in season or mm. adding some potatoes. Like I recently just did that and it's been forever <laughs> that I would be okay with that. It's like, all right, you know, looking at a whole thing I've been working on is, all right, yes, I can do this fasted. Yes, I can go on and not eat anything. Or yes, I can just do fat or now we're focusing on protein. But am I... Mm my reach and my goals. What is your goal? Is it weight loss? Is it performance? Mm. Is it longevity? Mm. And what if you are doing this in your numbers? If you're a cyclist, for example, doing like I was saying spin class on Wednesdays, I was doing and my FTP, it's called your functional threshold. Your power on the bike is really lacking what you could be capable of because I'm not eating 15 hours before. What if I could excel if I had a little something beforehand, maybe it's just in my coffee. So I think we get so strict because we are so type A driven, ambitious that we don't really learn to listen to what our body needs as an individual Mm. and when to listen to what it needs. And even before that, understand how to listen to your body, that it's, you know, not cravings and eating junk, but it's knowing that, okay, I'm fueling my body for what it needs for this specific workout or for this time of the month. You've mentioned about intuitive training and fueling. One thing I've learned over the years, because there was a point where I was at burnout and I know you've said adrenal fatigue, it's not really a term we should use. And it's the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction because it's all dysfunction of the hormones. But now I am very intuitive in the way that I do train and fast. I am not an athlete, but the athletes that you see, do you, how, when they're in the luteal phase of their menstrual cycle, if they're still cycling, how do they actually achieve the sessions that they need to achieve for their training? That's just something that's interested me because it's not some, it's not where I am in my life, where I'm training to do a marathon, training to do a 5k, Debbie is, is where I'm at. But how do you, how, how do you, um, how do you, how do you look at patients in that? in that phase and see how they should be training because there's quite strict training regimens that they should be adhering to, to be able to hit their targets. So tell me a bit more about that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't, I know for running, for example, it's, it's easy to pay attention because I have it or I don't have it. (laughs) So Mm. it's like, you can't push through. I can't push through it. My husband feels like I watch him run. He can run the same pace all the time and look great. Yeah. And then I'm just like, okay, I feel like crap today. I'm slow. Mm. I'm fast. And it varies as a female athlete, I think more mm. so. But I think late luteal phase, I have to, when I take on clients, it's fascinating to me that I can match all this information together. So I use a program called Training Peaks with clients or yes. starting to use TriDot, but it's really using that platform to look at their workouts, but you can upload your scores from Aura or Whoop or people use Apple Watch and they're not 100% accurate unless you wear a true, you know, chest strap and measure your heartbeat accurately than just the Aura ring or red light from your watch. But we can see the differences if you, I kind of made this whole spreadsheet for my clients and put in training peaks that, you know, your HRV is going to drop in luteal mm-hmm. phase and your heart rate's going to be higher. And I started paying attention to myself, like, all right, my heart rate's usually 41, mm-hmm. 40, and then it suddenly goes up and my temperature's up and then my HRV is usually pretty good. And then it drops and you kind of freak out like, oh my God, what am I doing? And so you have to use that information. Well, I would say, you know, we collect all this data, but don't do anything with it. Mm. It's just like, all right, this is great. I can geek out on all this information, but are you actually using it to 
change how you're eating, to change what your sleep hygiene routine is? Are you changing your workout schedule? Because I think a lot of people don't even pay attention. They get all this stuff, look at it, but don't apply it. And I know we're going to talk about Pinoe metabolic testing. Same thing. You can get all this data when you test, but if you're not assessing and creating a program based on your test results or your metrics, what you what good is it? <laughs> so yeah, I think luteal I, phase is important to make those adjustments. I think a lot of people push through it and ignore that. And it takes working with a coach to really go one-on-one and figure out what's what's the benefit for them to no, I totally agree. And for the listeners out there, HRV, heart rate variability in that luteal phase, when the progesterone does rise, we will see an increase in our core body temperature and our heart rate. And some, you know, I feel at that time, especially that, you know, I have to nurture my body and slow down the activities that I do. And, and I think a lot of people feel that when you push through, and you're causing the progesterone to plummet because your cortisol is going high and there'll be that cortisol steal. That's when people really do struggle. You've mentioned a few things there about, you know, when you've been running with your husband and, you know, he doesn't feel any changes in it, whereas you do. Tell me about that kind of sex difference there, because, you know, I know Stacey Sims does a lot of work, you know, um, we're not small men, you know, all the research seems to be on men and mice and we can't extrapolate that to women. So tell me a bit more about that. Hmm. Well, as a competitive athlete, it's when you go from being a strong runner and then you have this breakdown, burnout, metabolic chaos, I just, I don't have my, that's my area of opportunity. I say my one thing, Mm -hmm. I really want to just get stronger and faster running and figure out, you know, what's off balance in my body and work on that. But, you know, for me, it's, it's just, we go out by time instead of miles and just go out. And I sometimes have to take a left if he takes a right and go out and not worry about it. And that's why I think mentally you have to just let go of your mileage and your pace and people that are obsessed, like using a a Garmin watch. Mm. Sometimes it's nice. Like I just got this fixed since I was last three months using just a Timex stopwatch and just go by who cares if I run, if I walk, if I jog, you know, just look at, oh, I went out for 45 minutes or I'm doing a long run. I'm going out for 90 minutes and just enjoy the journey. And you have to switch your mindset and rewire your brain that you're trying to keep up and, and go out. So that's why I don't really like running with people because Mm. I do like that, but it's mentally challenging for me because I don't know what's going to happen with my body that day. So it's easier just go by myself, even though it's, not as fun, but I get my own headspace and my own therapy time and mm. and work on just, okay, I'm going to walk or I'm going to run, or I feel good today. I'm going to just do this workout. So then you can listen to your body. I think when we get mm. training with other workout partners, male or female, we don't know how to listen to our body and they might be running and your heart rate's super elevated and you're just exhausting yourself and not pacing yourself based on for the female athlete. Okay. It's luteal phase. I'm going to keep my heart rate down kind of the mafetone, the max aerobic function heart rate, 180 minus your age, and just train low zone one, two workout versus Mm -hmm. those people that aren't listening to their body tend to train way too high heart rate. So it's something I look at when I'm training, coaching them. I think, I think what you've said is really important there. Um, And you've, you've mentioned about training zones, which I'd like to touch on in a bit more depth. So tell me the importance of training zones for health and performance. Well, I think it's really important to have a purpose to each workout, you know, not just go for say a run every day, the same loop, you know, every, your workout each week, each month should be a little different females, each that premenstrual premenopausal. I mean, they should have a, your workout schedule will be different, you know, the first two weeks versus the last two weeks of your cycle. So changing your workout schedule, men, same thing. We shouldn't do the same workout every day and really looking at variety. So looking at different zones. So one is more recovery workout zone. Two is more that aerobic development zone three. We kind of call the black hole training, but maybe tempo and then zone four and zone five are going to be more your speed workouts, your hit training, or Stacey Sims says the SIT is short intensity interval training. Mm -hmm. So figuring out what those zones are specifically doing a metabolic test is ideal, but if not, just kind of doing a heartbeat 
an RPE, which is rates of perceived exertion to match that. What is your heart rate here? Let's say 120 heart rate. What is, how do you feel? 130 heart rate, 140, 150. And do your own test, but ideally find someone that can test you with a measure of oxygen consumption and carbon dioxide to figure out your zones and where you're burning the most fat, where you're switching metabolic crossover point to all carbs for fuel. They can get more specific, but then we can figure out if we test again, test and not guess, and mm -hmm. then do something with that data that we collect. You can do an assessment, say, here's your areas of opportunities. They use the word limiters or weaknesses, which I hate the word weakness. I think it's negative. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would say, what's your area of opportunity, yes. that weak link, and then we can create a program to improve and get all your systems in balance so you can be the best version of you as an athlete or just improve the aging process. Your longevity should be everyone's main goal, I hope. I think the way that you said it, like looking at what opportunity, we once we look at the data, seeing how we can improve and not having a negative stance on it, that having that positive psychology and mentality is just so important. And I know that your holistic method of coaching you look at the patient as a whole it's a personalized coaching program where you look at multiple elements you've touched on those already about looking at people's sleep stress and looking at how we can optimize their performance their health and longevity you've mentioned it was interesting before you were mentioning about how you prefer running alone I only had that conversation the other day with uh, my other half saying how I much prefer running alone and there are benefits to actually running in groups because of the mental wellness and the social connections that that gives us, but actually being intuitive and listening to your body. If you need to stop and walk, you don't feel that pressure there to keep going through. So I think that was really important how you highlighted that. But I may and, I'll add in, we start together. So I'm still meeting people, but being hmm. okay to meet back, start together and end at the same place. Yeah. And Tuesday night, I did, I need to start doing this every week, but I don't, it's at 6 p.m. at night, which I don't operate at night. <laughs> I'm a morning person to work out, but they do track workout. And so that's something I would do is my group workout mm. is do something that I need to go hard. And so you have to match your workout partners with what's the purpose of the workout. If I'm trying to do a speed workout, yes, I need to be with other people that are faster and going to push me and motivate me and drive me to go all out because I'm not good at that. And mm. then when I'm trying to go zone two, I need to be in my own headspace and mm -hmm. figure out how to pace myself and breathe and meet my body where it's at that day because that will change <laughs> all the time. Yeah. Mm, no, that's really interesting. And how your workout schedule can change from person to person. I mean, I think you've hit the nail on the head where you've said, looking at what that patient's goal is, is it weight loss? Is it to improve their you know, performance? So unless you've got that information, you, you need that information and then using the data that we're getting from these tools that we use. You know, I use my own tools to to utilize it and actually put that into place in some form of management plan. So I just wanted to touch on you. You've mentioned about metabolic efficiency and metabolic flexibility a few times in the conversation. Tell me a bit more about that. Well, we talk about I was just metabolic efficiency as you know how well do you burn fat as your main fuel source or not or you know how good are you at burning fat so we can test that at resting and at exercise with mm -hmm. a metabolic testing assessment kit that you're measuring your breath your carbon dioxide at what you exhale and what you inhale and your oxygen so that is kind of looking at that individual picture of what fuel source you're using, but we can also train our body bird more fat for fuel as how we train, but also how we eat as we know being fat adapted or, you know, going low carb and carb timing, but just kind of doing a reset for people that are coming from a high carb fuel plan, burning more, mostly carbohydrates as your main fuel source to switch that as your main fuel tank should be fat. And then you're, you've got your ketones there and then you've got the carbs as your backup fuel tank. So uh, what was Dr. Mindy? I was just rereading her book last night, but mm -hmm. metabolic flexing or switching. She calls it yes. switching. So you can switch mm -hmm. back and forth because what I think, because in our world or industry community, it drives me nuts because it's always one extreme or the other, right? So like mm -hmm. everything's bad. This is bad. This is good. It was all keto. Just eat fat, just <laughs> smother everything with butter and yeah. eat, you know, just eat fat all day. And I think a lot of people that backfired because that's all they're eating and then they're overeating and then they forgot about protein. And now we're all about mm. protein, but, you know, with healthy fats. And then 
carbs are all bad. And, you know, it's just, it just gets so confusing for people out there. Yeah. So that's why I was just forget the titles and just eat nature's food, real food that yeah. balances your blood sugar. And I think that if you eat that way and prioritize protein each meal mm. and hit those protein goals based on Dr. Gabrielle Lyons, mm. one gram of protein per pound of your ideal body weight, and then know that we can only absorb about 50 grams at a time. So if I try to space at 30, 50 grams each meal, if you're trying to get hundred grams or more protein, well, that kind of goes back to fasting that, okay, if I do mm. OMAD every day, I'm going to be always malnourished and not hitting my protein goals. So that doesn't work. And so how I can introduce more protein, if it's through essential aminos or having a shake and a meal or two meals, you know, it's figuring that out. But anyway, so naturally be, I think you become unintentionally fat adapted if you eat that way. And that's just kind of the benefit from it. And other thing is unintentional fasting because you're not as hungry if you are more satiated with healthy fats and healthy mm -hmm. proteins, and then you end up eating less. And then if you work on your sleep hygiene routine, you stop eating three hours before bed, well, then you automatically should be doing a 12 hour fast without you know, thinking about it. And then, you know, we talked about athletes doing 12 to 15 hours fasting. And so you kind of work on that, but that to answer your question about metabolic efficiency, about burning fat for fuel source and carbs is your backup fuel tank. And then metabolic flexibility to switch back and forth. Cause I think we get so stuck in having just keto carnivore all the time mm -hmm. or eating that way that I found that, you know, we can't digest the carbs. So really listening to other people speaking out like, Hey, it's okay to have some berries. It's okay yeah, to have yeah. some potatoes and really figure out when to put those in because I didn't do that for years. And so it's like, okay, I'm going to try it and not feel guilty. No, I, I think that's very important. You've mentioned about prioritizing protein, you know, muscles, a metabolic organ, and it's so crucial. We, we lose a certain percentage of that as we get older. And especially in people who are nearing the menopause, it's, it's essential. And we need that for our, it, it forms our basal metabolic rate and intuitively eating and fasting as well. I mean, we all naturally fast when we go to sleep. We all break our fast in the morning when we do have, or break our fast when we do have our first meal. But I love the word that you said, you know, you have berries, in season now and don't feel guilty, you know, looking at your gut health and how all of that's implicated in the the whole person itself. So the way that you've summarized that, I think is great. You've, you've mentioned quite a lot now about, we've mentioned nutrition. So a question I had was to look at how is best to fuel our training sessions and how we can match training with fueling. It's quite a loaded question there, but <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave that one with you. <laughs> Well, that's what I keep talking about on my show and trying to do videos and I'm trying to do these solo podcasts on Thursdays and Sundays that mm. I just talk about it because there's so much to dive into. So I've been just trying to pull up different articles that come out and discuss them. And, you know, it's just like, stop and think, does this work for me? Can I integrate any of these habits? Can I experiment? So I think it's, it's so, cause we, like you said, all the research pretty much is done on men and mice mm -hmm. and fruit flies. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> if we can look at women, but then no one's the same. So you really are needing mm -hmm. to do that N equals one experiment because no one is you. And if you just take all this information as just kind of, all right, let me take this and apply it to my own life. See what happens. Journal, mm -hmm. document, you know, track your numbers, look at your blood sugar, look at your heart rate, heart rate variability. And I mean, there's so much you can collect data and then tweak and know, okay, was this workout productive or did I have, a, was I struggling? And then you have to ask yourself, okay, is it okay to add a little bit of like this, like layered superfood creamer I've been putting in it. So my husband works for layered. So we have all these samples, but has mushroom adaptogens in it. And it, this, the vanilla or pumpkin spice, for example, has mm -hmm. coconut sugar in it. So I was doing the unsweetened because it didn't have anything. And they're like, wait a minute. I can just add a little bit of that and not feel like I'm breaking my fast and being a bad mm. person. Because it's so, it's so amazing how it's so psychological. It's like I have to fast 16 to 18 hours every day and I can't have any calories. So adding that before a workout 
is important. So what you're asking, because I could ramble on forever about this topic is so interesting to me because it's so individualized, but matching your nutrition, your fueling with your training. So if you are doing a morning workout that is really low heart rate, super easy, I don't think I need anything. And granted, I say all this and I don't always practice this because this is work mm -hmm. in progress. Like, okay, I'm not hungry. Should I eat something? So that's why my secret thing is just I'll add some, this Laird's natural creamer has MCT and mushroom adaptogens and coconut sugar as a sweetener. So I get some carbs and protein and fat. But then if I'm not doing, if I'm doing the low heart rate, I really just should have my black coffee and water and not mm. worry about it. If I'm doing a more of a interval run workout or spin class that I should add a little calories. So it depends on the time of day you work out. It depends on the duration, the intensity, and when did you last eat? Because that's been my struggle because some nights we go to the gym at 5.30 and I don't eat anything after that. So I try to take my amino acids afterwards. So if I'm not, if I'm eating my big meal at two o'clock and I'm not eating really anything from 3 p.m. on, and then I go work out the next day at 6 a.m., is that good for me? Is that if my goal is weight loss or is it performance? I want mm. performance. So then I should tweak my nutrition plan and figure out, Debbie, you need to eat that night if it's just a cup of bone broth or, yeah. you know, I have to be careful because I can't eat and go to bed because it comes back up. Yeah. <laughs> I can't sleep. So it's figuring out like, okay, what can I eat that won't spike my blood sugar or mess up my sleep or cause me to, you know, feel nauseous going to bed, lying mm -hmm. down and having this in my stomach. So that's where it gets to be really individualized working with clients, a coach client relationship to go, okay, let's, that didn't work. Let's do this. And so kind of looking at your ideal day is what I do for people. Okay. What time you wake up, what time you go to bed, let's write out the ideal day Put in where your workouts are, what your schedule is, kind of an average day, and then figure out that. And then on a weekend, mm -hmm. it's going to be totally different because yeah. I might not be as, I might be eating at night because we're going out Friday night. My workout might start at 8 a.m. And so maybe I need to add something. And so I don't know if I'm answering any questions. You are. <laughs> so I, th I think, I think what you've highlighted is how much of a complex area it is. And I think you mm -hmm. can't. You know, you've highlighted the issues that we need to look at, but no one size fits all. It can't be an, in, it has to be an individualized, personalized care plan for each person because everyone's different in what time they wake up and what type of exercise they do and what their goals are. I'm going to ask you to just, what, what adaptogens you've mentioned, just um, clarify from our listeners what adaptogens are. Well, I think of it as adapt is the word. They adapt. So they meet you where you are at. And so if I do lab testing as a Dutch test, look at people's hormones, mm. look at their cortisol, melatonin patterns we see. And there's so much information in Dutch test. People don't even know when you get it. You don't see that. There's so many clues that you can correlate to their GI test, to their blood chemistry panel, to their HTMA hair mineral analysis. And it's fascinating to me as I get more into it, if, you know, doing the three to five labs, but the, the body needs to usually have some, we all have stress and mm. it depends where you are in the HPA access progression of if you're kind of in that early, you, you know, you've got acute stress and you recover well for it, you're resilient. And then the next stage is, you know, your, your cortisol kind of stays elevated all the time, doesn't come back and have that highest in the morning, lowest at night. So we want to look at that pattern through the day. How much are you producing of cortisol versus how much are you using. And so there's a lot to look at. So adaptogens are often needed for people to become more resilient. Mm. So there's different ones, as you'll hear Dr. Stacy Sims keeps talking about the ashwagandha, mm. you know, the cordyceps the lion's mane for is more brain health. And then there's reishi for more calming to have at night. And so there's different purposes, purpose to them, but you know, you'll hear more about ashwagandha. And I went to this food show that's in Anaheim, every March is the world's largest Expo West. It's called Natural Product Show. And every year I kind of laugh at what the new thing is, CBD or turmeric. And this year is mm. ashwagandha. Yeah. Within everything. So you kind of see the trend of our world. Everyone's stressed out because yeah. 
you know, they're on all the time. They don't know how to shut off. They're on the devices. They're on their social media. They're on their electronic de- TV, whatever screen time. Mm. And we're just always in sympathetic overdrive. So yeah. mm. you can tell, I think a lot better HRV because I know a lot of people's HRV scores are really not optimal. And so that mm. shows your resiliency because you can measure your LF versus HF. And that will give us more clues that are you more sympathetic dominant or are you, you know, bouncing back between parasympathetic rest and digest to sympathetic fight or flight. And so we can look at that, but adaptogens like having them in your coffee or in your smoothie you can get different things, or you can take a, a capsule, but I'd rather liquids and get stuff in our food that, you know, not more pills. I'm into yeah, what can I we agree. get through our food and what can we get yeah. through the more liposomal supplement liquids. You've mentioned um, assess- assessments of athletes and you've mentioned this PNOE test. Tell me a bit more about that, what what it is, what the results show, how we can use it in in management plans when we're seeing patients. Yeah, I'm really excited. So I PNOE, P-N-O-E, it's a Greek company, Greek fam. They're all, <laughs> I was laughing at them because everyone I talked to there has got this really long name, Greek name, and they all start with P. So I get them all mixed up, Pavlos, <laughs> Panos, well, they're all P something in their, uh, I can't say their names properly or their last names, but it's a company that I met with 2018 in Ironman Hawaii. It's a metabolic testing kind of backpack that you can mm-hmm. do on the go. And so you're measuring, as I said, their, their oxygen and carbon dioxide, so what you're breathing. So it's a more of a breath analysis. So it's really fascinating because there's so much information we can collect. I used to do metabolic testing for 10 years with a company called New Leaf, but Lifetime Fitness, this franchise gym here, bought New Leaf so we couldn't test anymore because you have to buy parts every year and test credits. So I used to do this testing, but we in the past, we would just do the metabolic test to figure out people's training zones and figure out where they're burning fat, where they're burning the metabolic crossover point is where their fat drops and their carbohydrate usage goes up. And then we can say, okay, here are your training zones. But now there's so much more I want to do with this is figuring out the resting test. You can figure out how it's, you know, longevity markers. How efficient are you mm. at breathing? Do you hyperventilate, which can yeah. cause brain issues, your cardiovascular system. So you're measuring all these different metrics of your breath. So that's super amazing. So that's one part of it. But then also we can measure your metabolism at rest, looking at what fuel source you're burning based on your oxygen to carbon dioxide ratio. It's called the respiratory quotient, the RQ or RER. Then we can look at, you know, what are you great at burning fat or are you more carb burner? And then how can we analyze this data and create a program again, personalize it for you based on this data we collected. So it's not just doing the test. And I think this is what, you know, a lot of people do a bike test mm-hmm. or this test and, and not do anything. Like, how do I actually take even genetic tests? I've done multiple genetic tests. I'm like, all right, I got this report, but did I do anything with it? You know, what are you, how are you implementing into your training schedule and your fueling schedule? So the exercise test is obviously during exercise. So you do the same test, but now they're on a treadmill and it's a ramp test, or you can do different profiles. So say, you know, you go up every two minutes in speed or incline and then there's other ways i want to do it like a four minute test see where they're at and then go up another four minutes so you can get a snapshot at each heart rate and then your fuel source and then their oxygen you can see their fat oxidation rates and then your recovery but what i Uh, learned long time ago i'll throw in and then i'll be quiet uh stress mm. because as i say in my stories stress impacts everything so if you're, you know, eating real food, you're bouncing your blood sugar, you are doing the training, you're following your heart rate. If you have chronic stress accumulated from external and internal, it will impact your ability to burn fat and, and your exercise and your heart rate and everything. So testing after work in the early evening, after being in traffic, compared to first thing in the morning when you're more relaxed is is fascinating. So I'm excited to start doing that. It comes actually next week. So I'll start doing it here and take it with me wherever I go because it's a little suitcase. (laughs) That sounds really interesting. And just like you've mentioned, having a look at, it looks at multiple parameters and utilizing that to come up with a management plan and, and improve your client's 
performance. So if they're not using that lung capacity and they're hyperventilating, giving them tools so, so that they're aware of that and letting them know at what point they're going to switch between carb and fat burning. A, a question: We've got a few questions from um, my listeners that they've sent in because they knew I was speaking to you. One person's asked, how can we become a fat adapted athlete? Big question. <laughs> yeah, well, I did a slideshow on that for Dr. Dan Plews owns Endure IQ program. And it's kind of a four week for men, six week for women, women with a cycle. So we're going to match it up. But it's kind of what I created 10 years ago and intentionally is creating this the holistic method, this three day or three phase program. So basically you're just, you know, start with eating, swapping out what you're eating for real food. So that's mm -hmm. kind of phase one. Let's look at what you're eating and then let's start to choose this instead of that. And then we go to the next phase is phase two. All right, let's work on taking out, you know, the gluten for me is for my clients, take out the wheat, the gluten, mm -hmm. and the inflammatory foods. Yeah. A lot of times corn can be, you know, something to take out all it's kind of more I do in my detox kind of a reset and digestion repair, but taking out all the inflammatory foods. And then you get towards your body getting lower carbohydrate intake. And then they do, Dr. Dan, please do your IQ program is, is two weeks. You do two to four weeks, but it's two weeks for females kind of mapping it with their cycle, more of the follicular phase. And so you break it up, but men mm -hmm. do you know, a cold keto case that you're doing 50 grams total of carbohydrates and then getting mm -hmm. your protein and your fats. But then when you're done that for athletes, we can kind of go into the next phase is course correct and and find that sweet spot, he calls it, and then kind of yes. adjust. Because as we talked about already, it's matching your training, your fueling with your training. So, you know, we're going to add in some. And Dan Plews, his thing is, he says around 130 grams a day of carbohydrates. But who's that based on? You know, so it's still, yeah. I know some people, women might need more around ovulation. We're going to do more estrogen building foods and then progestin building foods and not being keto in your day 20 to beginning of your new cycle. So it's really, you know, taking that, but then adjusting it again for that unique individual. So I think it's four to six weeks, you know, and then some people I've worked with people that are really have sugar addiction. So it took us six months. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. it's not, it depends where you at. And I would say, I meet the client where they're at and there's no judgment. Let's just, let's what, what's going on in your life. How's your relationship with food? I have some people really struggle with, breaking up with sugar and its addiction and working on their why and kind of going a little deeper and then they'll have slip backs, you know, like, oh, see this donut or they go for ice cream. And then it's just how to reset and even, you know, what to do mm -hmm. kind of hack after that, go for a run or do some stair 30 second burst or something. Yes. But then work on identifying the why with functional lab testing. A lot of people have mm. super high candida. So they crave yeah. sugar because you're feeding mm. the bugs in your gut. So if you can, yeah. people can invest in their health a little further by doing some lab testing, then you can find out, okay, why have these cravings? Why do I mm. want to eat this? Sometimes it's something else going on that's yeah. driving you to want more. Uh, the fact that you've mentioned about, um, you know, candida increasing sugar cravings, again just highlights the complexity of it all because in the luteal phase when your progesterone's raised obviously carbohydrates are used to support and boost that so whether it's just a natural physiological response where we need to eat more carb or intuitively feel like we need to eat more carbohydrates or whether there's something pathological whether it's a can candida overgrowth i think it's really important to know you've you've mentioned what so out of interest what's the longest fast that you've done uh like 24 hours i don't i i don't really see the benefit or i'm not motivated to do a two or three day as an athlete i mean if you i, I find for cell top doing gut repair hmm. protocols and i'm reading over dr mindy's new book and her old book for hmm. women but it's the why do I need to? Is it just yeah. enough? Like if you listen to Rob Wolf of, for athletes, we're getting cell autophagy, having some coffee and exercising. So mm. do I have serious problems? I need to do a two or three day fast. Yeah, maybe once a year, but I need to not exercise. So 
If yeah. you put me at some spa resort that doesn't have food <laughs> on a beautiful island with blue water and a sandy beach, yeah, maybe I'll try it. Yeah, I just <laughs> give them all water. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't want to do, I can't, I know, I just, I don't see why I need to because mm -hmm. I'm, if I do a 24 hour or even 17, cause she talks to Dr. Mindy talks about that dimming dimmer switch yes. of 17 hours or longer. If I can do that, but for my athletes, I say you have to match it on your non workout day. So if you ideally have one or two days a week of your mm -hmm. active recovery that you're just doing walking, maybe some yoga, easy, easy workout. That's your rest mm -hmm. day. That day you can do a fast and I'm experimenting with, all right, well, I have clients that have really, damaged guts can we do that like a 16 8 fast that they're eating at eight hour window and just do a bone broth fast yeah yeah and then do that as they're healing because my a lot of the athletes are already not getting enough nutrients in we need the cell autophagy but you know how long do we need to fast to get that are we doing the other things to help with that so <laughs> I think you're right. I think it, it depends on why people are wanting to fast. I think utilizing it in whatever modality, whether it's a time restricted eating or a gut reset or a serotonin reset fast, dopamine reset. So I think there's reasons why they fast. People who have got a lot more metabolic dysfunction may benefit yes. from long, longer fasts and and that would assist with the weight loss for getting the glycogen out of the muscle and the liver. And so, yes, I think you're but quite right. are getting yeah. that already. So that's yes. why I keep saying in Dr. Mindy's post, I'll be okay. But if you're an athlete, <laughs> maybe not, you know, she talks yeah. about this OMAD and doing these extended fasts, but her target audience is a metabolically damaged person exactly. that needs all that yeah. help. I'm trying to go, okay, let's take that. But then what if you are exercising one, two, three times a day and you're really doing a lot and you don't have 50 pounds or more to lose? It's true because actually, because fasting in itself will just increase your cortisol and, and the longer you fast and then you're exercising, it's just, again, putting more pressure to cause that HPA dysfunction. So I think everybody there's a subset of pet that you've got your athletic population your normal population then you know you've got the people who have got that metabolic dysfunction and how we treat them is going to be very very different one but of I, one well, of, well mm. hold on there save that thought i want to throw in because i know say i told you we could talk forever but the <laughs> the dutch test i was asking yeah. around and trying to research this if your cortisol is super sky high like hyperadrenic should you fast? You already have so much stress. Is it beneficial for you? And then I have people that they're not producing any cortisol. They're so hypoadrenic. Mm. Is it beneficial? So I think you have to really look at when is it appropriate for that person based on their functional lab tests. Yes, they need healing. We need mm. cell autophagy. We need to boost our neurotransmitters. But let's do a gut test and a, a Dutch, a gut and a Dutch hormone test yeah, to right. really go, okay, is this right for you? Or is it going to cause more stress to you. Cause I think I was doing it fasting, really long fasting and exercising and totally stressed out running my own fitness studio that I caused more stress and got myself yeah. in more adrenal dysfunction again. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. One, just had to add that in. No, 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 no. I think you're right. And just for the listeners, the Dutch test is a urine test where we're measuring the hormones. It, one of my um, listeners has asked about fasted exercise and what are your thoughts, which I think we've maybe touched on slightly there, but have you got anything else to add for that comment? Well, just what we said is you need to match your fueling with your training. So if you are doing a low intensity workout, you don't need to worry. I think fasting is okay. It's also working backwards. Look at when you last ate. If your dinner was at 6 p.m. or mine's often my big meals at 2 p.m., 3 p.m., when is it appropriate to eat before you work out? So female athletes... I work with Ben Greenfield and he talks the 12 to 15 hours is sufficient fasting. And that's what I hear more people are saying for athletes, men and women, more 12 hours for women during luteal phase. And then, mm -hmm. you know, looking at you're doing the high intensity, should you then add a little like a half yeah. a bar or add some calories mm -hmm. in your coffee? And then women afterwards, Stacey Sims guidelines, you know, she's, you know, off, not into fasting. She's into protein, but she, she doesn't yeah. think, you know, women should eat before and they should eat 30 minutes afterwards. And it, I was always disagreeing with that for years. And I'm like, oh, you know, maybe 
I need to fill up that tank. It doesn't mean a huge meal. It just means, you mm. know, a little something protein and carbs post-workout in 30 minutes and men can wait for three hours. But again, the guidelines for fasted exercise, I go into this over and over again in my podcast, but it's different for men mm. than women. And so, I mean, from f- taking me as an example as N equals one, I th- there's a lot of metabolic dysfunction here and I do do fasted exercise. Prior to doing any high intensity exercise, I do take either some sm- a small handful of berries, you know, so that I've got my immediate glucose there for when I'm doing my high intensity exercise. And yeah, and I think because I've got that metabolic dysfunction there, you, doing the high intensity training helps tap into the fat stores within the liver, within, you know, the, the the belly area. So that's my reason and my why. And I suppose it's just like you've mentioned earlier as well is with everybody, we should try something and just review it. And I think being able to actually change our opinions as more evidence comes out and more we see our patients, I think it's all, we're all on a learning curve and it's just trying to learn from that really. So I th- yeah, um, my next question for um, for you is what's the top what are your top nuggets and lessons that you've learned as an athlete over the years that you want to share with the audience hmm. well we've talked a lot about that I think it is not being so hard on yourself so competitive with yourself and others that you try to do fasted exercise that it's okay to eat not feel guilty mm-hmm. that you're doing something wrong it's I think we got so strict and kind of a different type of eating disorder, I would say, Mm. if you want to take it that way, it'd be, you know, we get so orthorexic that we're not eating and over-exercising. And, you know, I hear people almost bragging that they're, oh, I can not eat. And then men will say this and then women try to do that. And it's just frustrating to me. So it's just so, what I've learned is that I'm not you, (laughs) you're not me. Let me figure out what works best for me. And not be so hard on myself if I do eat something, you know, just have a small amount and not overindulge and go into a binge, but just eat a little something sometimes can improve the outcome. So right now my goal is performance. I Mm -hmm. want to get stronger and faster. So I'm focusing on what I can do for that. And as I age and I turn 50, now I'm suddenly 51, I'll be Going up in my, you know, second half of my life, I want to get faster and stronger. And as I watch, my dad just passed away and my mom mm-hmm. is 81. And it's, it's really looking at how your parents age and your, their mm-hmm. friends and seeing, okay, my focus should be strength training and eating yes. protein and not, not eating at all and get that low energy availability, LEA. And I think it's important to look at okay, how do I want to be living when I'm 80. And that's kind of my goal now as an athlete. And when I'm working with clients, like, well, are you doing what you're doing now? Is that going to help you five years from now, 10 years from now? Are you Mm -hmm. making yourself worse if you're training and racing way too much? Yeah, I think that, I think you've hit the nail on the head there about looking at what your goal is at the time and muscle the importance of prioritizing protein, good quality protein and prioritizing it. It's such an important metabolic organ that we should, should, optimize because of the benefits that it has and also the the benefits to bone health as well as we get older not just the you know the benefits if you're going to be doing strength training the impact that will have on your bone health as well is there any health hacks that you practice that you want to share with us what's your favorite health hack Mm -hmm. um right now i'm just i got uh an infrared near mid far infrared sauna from sun light and i used to have Mm. my fitness studio we just got it again this january so i've been trying that and doing a liver detox supplements before I go in and then parasympathetic essential oils behind my ear mm. help to really maximize the detox effects and then take a binder when I get out from Quicksilver or GI detox. So I've been doing that. And then we've been doing this 15 minute stretching routine before bed. And based on kind of research, Huberman lab talked about the flexibility. If you just hold each stretch 30 seconds, four on one side, four on the other side, you do that three circuits around. So we've been doing that at night. I put the fireplace on and candle and just try to chill and do that. Yeah. Well, I'm Mm -hmm. trying to work my HRV score and it's, you know, doing that and doing the sauna really helps and taking glycine before bed and magnesium in my parasympathetic oil behind my ear, I think is the biggest thing that's helped lately, but 
it's pretty good. You've mentioned we've because we've talked quite a lot about fueling and exercise, but I think the fact that we're talking about the importance of recovery as well, and actually what we can do to try and calm yeah. and well, yeah, we can do that. Would be another show because I find that <laughs> is, sleep is huge, and since my adrenal stuff, and I, you know, you wake up two in the morning, wide awake, no one messes with my sleep. <laughs> no, I know. Priority. And I don't do stuff. I'm kind of lame person that I need to be home at seven o'clock. I'm going to bed. You know, I, the other night we got home from track workout late and I freaked out. I'm like, oh my God, it's almost eight o'clock. I got to be going to sleep. And it's, I almost like got myself stressed out because it was past my bedtime. So, I know. you know, figuring it out is a big part for recovery. I've, I've just I've just come back from America, so the jet lag is real, and the lack of sleep is not. You know, my body clock. I'm needing to use some hacks to make it back to the 24 hours. You've mentioned earlier on as well about how we should work smarter, not harder, and you said life's not a race; it's a journey. And I know you've got a book. So, would you want to tell um, my listeners how they can find you and what what work you've done and the books that you've done? Yeah, I put together kind of was more of a journey for me to process why why did I get this whatever illness, stress, fatigue, breakdown, metabolic chaos, we say as practitioners and no one else did that I knew of. It's like, why did I get this? So I, I wrote a book, Life's Not a Race. It is a journey that's mm-hmm. on Amazon. And then I also put together the eight elements of what I call the holistic athlete, the holistic method working on the whole athlete is on Amazon in a workbook to work on your inner core Mm -hmm. and then kind of writing things out because I think you have to figure out your why, what's your purpose, what's Mm -hmm. your mission, what drives you, but then figure out like, what are your goals before you even do the, you know, becoming a fat adapted athlete. You have to kind of go through some worksheets, I think, to really get your mind right. And then my website, debbiepotts.net and the podcast. And the podcast, which is, is, is amazing. The podcast, I encourage everyone to listen to that. And finally, Debbie, I ask all my guests, um, I end on this year, I'm focusing on the word balance, trying to balance hormones. Is there a word that you're focusing on for 2023? Uh, hmm, good question. I think, yeah, the, the balance is a good one. Homostasis, restoring mm-hmm. balance, but I think it's just my future self, just what I can do to improve my future self. Look at longevity, like you've mentioned as well, and looking at the future. Thank you so much, Debbie, for coming on today. It's been a real pleasure having you here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. And we'll share this on my show too, so we can get people to learn more about you. And my story, I think, is, you know, I never really share on my show. So I'll put this out because it's good. I think why I do what I do is because I want to help other people avoid what happened to me last 10 years. Because no one helped me but myself. <laughs> yes. So yes, I think that that's very pertinent, very true. And um, I'll have the show notes available afterwards for everyone to look at and make sure you give Debbie a follow on Instagram and have a look at the resources she's created. It's an excellent resource out there. So thank you very much, Debbie. Take care. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Low Carb Athlete Podcast. If you have any questions, feedback, or topic suggestions, let us know on Facebook or at DebbiePotts.net. You can help us to continue to grow by leaving a review on iTunes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.